Good afternoon. Welcome to the first introductory lecture for Biology 3010 General Genetics. This will be the very first lecture that serves to give us a little bit of intro or background into the topic of genetics. If you've taken a class with me in the past, you will find that this is usually where I like to start. Give us some general background, some general history to give us an understanding of where the field was and where we are today in our understanding. What I'd like to do first is start off with a few basic definitions. The very first one is genetics. What specifically is genetics? The word genetics comes from the Greek word gen, G-E-N, and it means to become or to grow into. When we talk about genetics, it is considered the study of heredity and variation. So with that, we need to also define heredity and variation because they are terms used in our modern day definition of genetics. Heredity is referred to as the transmission of traits. How do traits get passed on from one generation to the next? That's the concept associated with heredity. Variation, on the other hand, is the fact that offspring tend to look different from parents and from siblings, and that there's a great deal of variation that we can observe in nature, and this aspect of genetics is another thing we try to understand and describe. So now that we have that basic definition of genetics understood, what we want to do, or what I would like to do, is talk a little bit about the historical perspective or a brief history of genetics. In the di diagrams that you see on this particular figure, the one on the left has a picture of uh, several different breeds of domesticated dog, and the one in the right corner um, is several different strains or varieties of the wild mustard, and I'm going to address each one of these figures here in just a minute. So historically, there have been very early accounts of what's referred to as selective breeding. This was very common in animals, like you see for the domesticated dog. However, it didn't stop with the domesticated dog or start with the domesticated dog. There are plenty of examples of selective breeding in cows, camels, ox, and again, the dog that you see here on this picture. So what has happened over a long period of time is the domesticated dog, which is a single species, derived from the ancestral wolf species, like you see in the very top left corner of that figure with all of the dogs on it. Again, what you can see in that figure is that dogs come in all shapes and sizes, and this is really due to breeding efforts on the parts of individuals who wanted desirable traits to be passed on to the next generation of dog. And again, it is the selective breeding process where humans have played a role in deciding which animals are going to mate with one another to hopefully produce traits that are desirable in the offspring. The top right hand corner is just a little meme that I thought kind of comes in uh, pretty handy with this particular topic. Um, and up at the top you see what is a wolf and so this would represent the ancestral wolf and this poor wolf is basically saying you know what's the harm in going to ask or beg for a couple of table scraps. And what you see uh, thousands of years later is the result of that process. Now, selective breeding processes did not stop with animals or was not exclusive to animals. There are plenty of historical examples of selective breeding programs, again, utilizing the same concept, mating specific plants to produce offspring that are more desirable for a given characteristic or trait. So in the bottom right hand corner of this slide you see in the very center of that image what's known as the wild mustard. And from that you have all of these derivatives that are depicted on that figure. Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, brussels sprouts, kale, and um, some of you may not be familiar with the one in the bottom far right is kohlrabi. Just like the dog example all of these plants represent the same species. 
And what has happened over a course of time is that farmers were interested in particular traits and allowed for selective breeding processes to enhance those particular traits. So for example, for cauliflower, the cauliflower that we know today is the derivative of the flower clusters from this particular plant species. Or cabbage um, is where there were terminal buds in this particular plant species. And Brussels sprouts, um, which basically look like little cabbages, uh, have terminal buds associated with them. So again, there were desirable traits that were selected for over a period of time to allow for this variation that we see. And so this hones in on this one aspect of variation in the definition of genetics. How is it that we have this variety in appearance overall? And hopefully as we continue on with this course, you'll get an understanding of how that variation comes into play. So what I wanna do now is transition a little bit and focus on individuals who had a great deal of influence on our modern day understanding of genetics. So we'll start back with the early Greek influence, somewhere around 400 to 300 BC. And with that, we'll start with the work of Hippocrates. Hippocrates, as you may be familiar with, is considered the father of modern day medicine. In fact, physicians take what's known as the Hippocratic Oath that comes directly from Hippocrates' work. Interestingly, Hippocrates was really interested in lots of different things, not necessarily just medicine, and he was one of the first to record ideas of inheritance. What he proposed for inheritance was a mechanism known as pangenesis, or he referred to as pangenesis. And in this concept, what he proposed was that each part of the body of an adult would produce a seed that would travel through the blood to the reproductive organs, and these seeds passed from parents to offspring during conception. There was something in these seeds that he proposed was contributing to the traits that were being passed on to the next generation. An additional Greek influence came from the work of Aristotle. Aristotle had a series of observations that he made regarding transmission of traits as well. One thing that he proposed was that offspring resemble the parents. And this is kind of like my, well, no duh kind of concept in that he noted that it was very clear that offspring looked a lot like their parents. But he was the first to sort of record this idea, so we're gonna give him some credit to that. In addition, he also noted that things that were not considered structural were also uh, passed on or seemingly passed on from generation to generation. Now, when I say structural or not structural, what he meant was things that weren't clearly obvious. So when we talk about traits that are obvious, you might talk about hair color or eye color or um, height, uh, that type of thing. But he also noted that these, these things that were not clear structural characteristics, something like the sound of someone's voice or the gait, meaning the way that they walked, also was seemingly inherited or passed on from generation to generation. And this was something that was very interesting to him. The last thing I want to mention that he contributed as far as his series of observations was that traits appeared again in generations down the road. So he noticed that sometimes traits would seemingly disappear in a generation, but then would reappear in the next generation. And this concept really caused him a great deal of confusion as to why that was happening. Now, Aristotle also had another idea in that he proposed something known as the vital heat. And in this concept, what he proposed, that there was a mixing of semen from men or males and menstrual blood from females that would mix and somehow produce to give rise to offspring. Now, at this particular point in time, it wasn't really clear how reproduction exactly occurred, but that there had to be some sort of mixing event that took place in order to allow for reproduction to take place. 
And so his proposal was that there was something in the semen and something in the menstrual blood that mixed together to produce offspring. So now we're going to jump ahead several hundreds of years to um, an era that's referred to as pre-Mendelian uh, era or concepts. And this is about 2,000 years later after the Greek influence that we just talked about. Now, some of the ideas that predated Mendel, which hopefully at this point in time, you're very familiar with the concept that Mendel is in fact considered the father of modern day genetics. But what I wanna do is sort of set the stage for the ideas that were prevalent at the time when Mendel's work um, was just emerging. The first one, and this is a biggie, is a concept known as blending inheritance. Blending inheritance proposed that offsprings are somehow, or offspring, excuse me, are somehow an intermediate to their parents. What this suggests is that characteristics from parents somehow blended to form the characteristic in the offspring. And this was really the going idea um, at this particular time point as far as how inheritance worked. So let me give you an example of blending inheritance. With blending inheritance, what you would expect is if you had a very tall parent and a very short parent, and if they were to produce offspring, they would have middle or intermediate sized offspring. Um, this is the concept of blending. You blended the tall with the short and you got medium or intermediate in between. Um, another example that's a little different is when you talk about mixing paint colors. If some of you are familiar with the concept of uh, colors and how colors mix, if you take blue paint and you take yellow paint and you mix them together, the color that you're gonna get is green. And so this is a blending of the two colors, the blue and the yellow, that would result in the green color. And this is the concept again behind blending inheritance. Characteristics from one parent and characteristics from the other parent somehow blended or melted together to produce the characteristic that you see in the offspring. Now, another idea at the time is something known as epigenesis. Epigenesis suggests that all organs are formed de novo, meaning they're newly formed in the embryo. And here the concept is that there's something present in the egg that caused all of the organs to form. So again, it's a little far off, but not completely far off to our modern understanding of how reproduction takes place. Um, but epigenesis, again, suggested that all of the organs formed newly when reproduction occurred. A little vague concept, but still um, in line with some of the things that we think about today. The last concept that I wanna add that was a pre-Mendelian idea is probably one of my favorites. Um, and it's referred to as preformation. Now with preformation, what was proposed was that the sperm contained a complete miniature adult and all this complete miniature adult needed was the nutrients provided by the egg to then begin to grow and develop. So all you needed to do was add a little bit of nutrients and that tiny individual would grow. Um, obviously, this was a very male-centric point of view in that the male produced uh, or provided the offspring and the female basically just watered the garden to allow for the individual to grow. Now, the last thing I want to say with this particular slide as far as our history of genetics is concerned is that I want to give you a few additional ideas that were occurring at the time. And this was the same time period where the atomic theory was coming about. The atomic theory states that all matter is composed of small invisible units called atoms. In addition, this was also the time that the cell theory was being formulated. The cell theory is proposing all organisms are composed of basic units known as cells. So this particular period of time was really sort of the, the burst in our understanding and our knowledge in scientific knowledge um, was growing vastly at this particular point in time. Now, before we move on to the work of Gregor Mendel, what I want to talk briefly about is the work of Charles Darwin. Here too, you have a scientist um, who might be credited with another 
concept altogether. And uh, what you might be familiar with is Charles Darwin is considered the father of modern day evolutionary thought. This is true, but without genetics, there is no evolution and evolution and genetics go hand in hand as we will see as we continue on throughout the semester. Um, but the work of Charles Darwin is really important, again, to then uh, preface what we're going to talk about with Gregor Mendel. So Charles Darwin wrote a book known as The Origin of Species, and in The Origin of Species, what he proposed was a mechanism known as natural selection. This is oftentimes also referred to as survival of the fittest. What natural selection proposes is that over time, slight but advantageous variations will accumulate, and these variations are inherited. So you can see again, this work predates the work of Gregor Mendel, but ties in really nicely with our genetic concept and this understanding of traits and variation and passing them on to the next generation. Now, what you may not be familiar with is that after that body of work, Darwin continued to work on research and scientific experiments when he returned back home to England. Another set of papers that he published was dealing specifically with crosses that he was performing between pigeons. And uh, one paper in particular is titled Variation of Plant and Animals Under Domestication. What he did was compile observations from known data as well as his own scientific experiments that he was conducting by crossing different types of pigeons. And you can see the pigeons in the, in the far right-hand corner overall. With this work, he also then re-established um, the concept of pangenesis. Now, Darwin's version of pangenesis is a little different than the one that we talked about previously with Hippocrates. What Darwin proposed was that there were these things that he refers to as gemules, and gemules were small parts of every cell that somehow did in fact get to the sex cells, and every sex cell had a complete set of these gemules. And these gemules are what allowed for the transmission of traits from one generation to the next. So the two ideas of pangenesis are very similar. Um, Darwin's version was just a little modified compared to that of Hippocrates. Now what I like to add is that what you see in the top right hand corner is basically um, the equivalent of a $10 bill in the UK. And what I wanted to note here is that uh, our money has usually dead presidents on it. <laughs> um, but what you can see here in the United Kingdom, they actually have um, a very famous noted scientist on their, again, equivalent of a $10 bill. And so that just shows you sort of the emphasis that maybe other countries may put on science uh, overall. Okay, so now what I wanna do is talk a little bit about Gregor Mendel. We are gonna look at his body of work um, not in the next lecture, but the one immediately after that. And we're going to talk extensively about the work and Mendel's contribution to our understanding of genetics. But what I'd like to do at this point is just sort of, again, help set the stage for where we're going um, in this course. So Mendel proposed an idea known as particulate inheritance. And particulate inheritance was a complete opposite concept compared to the going idea that we just talked about known as blending inheritance. What Mendel proposed from his body of work was that there was a specific unit that gets passed on from generation to generation and that those units retained their identity in the subsequent generations. And this was completely different from the concept again of blending inheritance where the concept was that traits blended together in order to give you the appearance you see in the offspring. Just a little bit of background on Gregor Mendel. Um, <clears throat> Gregor Mendel came from uh, what is referred to as a peasant uh, community or peasant farming um, background in what is now known as the Czech Republic. Uh, he only had a grade school education but was really, really smart 
And one of the only ways the individuals who were poor and didn't have enough money um, to allow for their children to continue their schooling was to um, join the monastery or basically join the um, church. And so this is why Gregor Mendel actually ended up becoming a monk, was to help um, continue on with his schooling. He had a really interesting hobby, um, maybe not really interesting hobby, but a hobby that he had was gardening. But in gardening, what he wanted to try to do was to make different or new types of flowers emerge by doing specific crosses between um, individual plants. And it was this hobby that grew into this scientific body of knowledge that, again, we're going to talk about um, in two lectures. He was the very first to systematically breed and analyze things mathematically. Now, this is really interesting because what he noted and what we will talk about are the statistical patterns that emerged from specific crosses that he would perform. Nowadays, almost every body of work has some type of statistical um, work that's going to back up or help support a concept. At the time, statistics was sort of looked down upon, and so Mendel's work went unnoticed for several years because of that particular um, component. But he did note very consistent patterns that were occurring, and it was this observation with the consistent patterns and the statistical analysis that laid the foundation for, again, our modern day genetics. Now, this particular course is referred to as general genetics, and it is meant to give you a foundation in general genetic concepts. But what I wanna point out is that Genetics itself is actually a really broad field. There are three main facets to the um, genetic realm, and that includes what's referred to as transmission genetics that you see in panel A. And transmission genetics really focuses on the study of inheritance of traits from generation to generation. And this is actually where we're going to start our lecture series in getting a really strong understanding of transmission genetics. How do traits get passed on from one generation to the next? Within transmission, uh, transmission genetics, there is another subdivision known as cytogenetics, and this is really the study of chromosomes overall and chromosome structure. And we'll talk a little bit about that in this uh, unit of material dealing with transmission genetics. Another facet is molecular genetics, and molecular genetics is focused on understanding the expression of genes and how the genetic material is copied and how that expression of genes is regulated. So this is again looking at the molecular level, looking at the gene and how the gene is expressed overall. And we will focus uh, quite a bit of uh, time talking about molecular genetics. And then the last category is population genetics. And population genetics is the study of how and why genetic variation is maintained or lost in a population. Typically with transmission genetics and molecular genetics, we are looking at individuals. In population genetics, we are looking at variation in a given population. So again, the scope changes just a bit with population genetics. As I mentioned in one of the previous slides, evolution and genetics go hand in hand, and so you could list evolution as a separate facet overall of genetics, but oftentimes it's considered a separate entity all in itself. But you can't have evolution without understanding how genetics works. Uh, again, they do go hand in hand. So throughout the semester, we are going to be looking at these three broad categories of genetics, again, because this is a gene general genetics course. We do offer a molecular genetics course as a um, upper division elective. And if we were on a much larger campus, we might actually have a population genetics course. Um, we do offer a evolutionary genetics course, which uh, ties in the molecular and the population and aspects just a little bit. But so you can see that genetics itself is not just a really simple 
um, one-sided concept, there's many levels to our understanding of genetics. And again, hopefully you'll get a good feel for that throughout the semester.